Okay. Uh, no, just from all this meeting in for Sunday school in here that it's um, you know special week. We're having our fall uh, Bible conference, and John Morris, uh, seated up here in the front pew, is our guest speaker. He's uh, coming to us from from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which again I've told people I've been let down. Uh, sorry, but since uh, yesterday when I found out that apparently the Oak Ridge boys are not from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And that was a childhood staple when I was very young for my parents and uh, now I don't know what to do. I don't know where to place them. I gotta go find out where they're from. But uh, we had a really good uh, time last night and a good uh, time looking at, at God's law. You know, sometimes we think the Ten Commandments, sometimes we get the idea, or it's popular in a lot of uh, modern Christianity to think that they, that doesn't really have that much to say to us today and that was for back then. And, I couldn't be further from the truth, our God who does not change. Uh, so we're, we've uh, begun in that, and we'll continue this morning, and then the session this afternoon, and our I'm sorry, this morning in our worship service, and then tonight at 6 o'clock when we uh, reconvene again, uh, lastly, to hear about God's law. So um, is Pastor Matt here? I was going to ask, are there any announcements you want me to bring up? Okay, just that. Try to be here. Uh, this evening if you can it's been uh, really good so far so um let's pray and uh then we're going to sing and then uh reverend morris is going to come up here and share the word for us uh in this sunday school so let's go to god and ask him to bless this time our gracious father lord uh in your providence we're brought to another day a beautiful day lord that you have created uh we're to uh, rejoice and be glad in it um, it's a day of salvation, a day where uh, Jesus Christ reigns, Lord, a day where you e exist, we exist in you, uh, fallen creatures, those made in your image, Lord, but those whom you have uh, given your son for and have drawn and brought to yourself and reconciled to you. So, Father, uh, it's a day to rejoice uh, for what you have done and, Lord, who you are. Uh, we pray that as we uh, meet today that you would be with uh, Pastor Sean. We pray you'd give him unction, that you'd give him the grace that he needs to speak, to speak what your word says, to do so clearly and boldly. Uh, Lord, that you'd give us all hearts to hear, uh, ears to hear, Lord, and hearts that are receptive to your word. Our Father, again, we thank you and pray that we don't take this uh, absolute privilege and blessing uh, for granted. So we thank you for your mercy, Lord. Um, Please be with us, and again, we come asking this in Christ's name, amen. Well, if you would take your hymn book and remain seated, uh, but uh, Psalm 95C in your hymn book, now with joyful exultation, Psalm 95C, uh, let's uh, just remain seated and let's uh, sing this together.
let us uh, listen and, and obey uh, God's word. And Reverend uh, Morris, if you'd come now, please, and, and uh, bring God's word to us. Well, good morning, friends. Good morning. Good to be with you all. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me once again to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 this morning. We are in the midst of our little series this weekend on the first table of the law, what's been classically called the first table of the law in traditional Reformed and Presbyterian circles, and that means commandments one, two, three, and four, the commandments that are primarily about our duty toward the Lord, our God, life toward God, we're calling this little series. And so the second commandment is what we're going to take a look at here during the Sunday school hour. And let me preface this by saying the second commandment is one of those things where if you did not grow up in a traditional Presbyterian environment, the classic Reformed teaching on the Second Commandment, it might sound a bit strange, uh, perhaps even a little bit severe if it's something you've not heard before. Well, we do not wish to be unduly offensive, but we do want to be clear. We want to be faithful to what the Bible teaches and faithful to our Westminster Confession and Catechisms, our confessional standards. We want to be clear, uh, but we also want to be patient and pastoral and understanding. Uh, you may have questions on some of these things. Maybe you need some time to mull things over if you're hearing them for the first time, and that's fine. But let us strive to give ourselves over to God's word and to trust that the word and the spirit will work in our hearts to bring us into greater conformity to the mind of Christ as he has given his will to us and revealed and disclosed his will to us in the scripture. So this morning we're thinking about the second commandment. The, the first commandment, which we thought about last night, has to do with worshiping the right God. Reject every false god and worship the right God, the first commandment teaches. Well, the second commandment has to do with worshiping the right God in the right way, in the right manner. So let's pray, and then we'll read a few verses from Exodus chapter 20, and then we'll study this together for a few minutes. Let's pray. Well, Lord our God, grant the ministry of your Holy Spirit, we ask, upon this gathering of your people. So that as we read and study your word, we may also receive illumination to understand and believe the word and to rest on Christ as he speaks to us and comes to us in this, your holy word. We do ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 this morning. This is God's holy word. Hear it. And God spoke all these words, saying... I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me. The commandments. Amen. Thus far, God's holy and inspired and inerrant word to us today. May he write its eternal truth on every one of our hearts. You may have heard the quip before. Many a, many a preacher has used it. It's not unique to me, but it goes like this. In the beginning, God made man in his own image, and ever since then, man has been trying to return the favor. One of the fundamental distinctions of Christianity, especially against other major world religions, is that we are a word-based faith. In the beginning, as John says it in chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, Jesus Christ. God spoke, and creation happened. God spoke in ages past to our fathers by the prophets. Hebrews 1 tells us that. And then that spoken word, of course, was eventually written down and is now what we have as our Bibles. Christians have many times over the years been called a people of the book. And that is why, by the way, we, our worship services are so word-centric. God has come to us. He's revealed himself to us in his word, and this is how we know him. Right? Not through dreams and visions, not through images, but through his word. 
And so that's why in our worship services we read God's word and we preach God's word. And when we pray, we will often pray God's word or pray phrases from God's word back to him. And when we sing, we so often sing God's words back to him. We sing the Psalms or we sing hymns that are replete and full of biblical terminology and biblical expressions. In the sacraments, as has so often been said throughout church history, we see God's word made visible the promises of God put in tangible expression. We'll say more about that later. We have, as other theologians have put it, not an image-based liturgy, but a word-based liturgy. God speaks in his word, and his people listen. And that's what the second commandment is driving at. Like we see in Exodus chapter 19. If you know Exodus 19, right before God gives the law, what's the big idea of Exodus 19? The big idea is that the king gets to set the terms of how we may engage with him. The king has decided how he would like to be worshipped and how he would not like to be worshipped. So as we noted last night in the first commandment, the law of God is both spiritual and it's comprehensive. That is, each of these commands is really a summary. Each commandment is a summary for a whole category of sins forbidden and duties required of us. For each commandment, there's always two sides to the coin, aren't there? Negatively, when we hear a commandment, we're hearing, don't do these things. But then positively, it's telling us, be sure and do these things. And that's why our larger catechism is so helpful for us in further understanding the Ten Commandments, because it tells us the host of sins forbidden that's summarized in each commandment and the host of duties required that's summarized in each commandment. And so... More than just a bare forbidding against making images of our immortal, invisible God, the second commandment is teaching us positively that God wants to be worshipped in his way, not according to our vain or creative imaginations. How many of us have taken pictures of breathtaking vistas? Places like the Grand Canyon or Pikes Peak or a, a sweeping valley like in the Swiss Alps and we're standing on a mountaintop. And we we take those pictures on our phones and we put put those pictures up on our social media. And how many times do we say, oh, it was so beautiful. It took my breath away. But this picture just doesn't do it justice. You have to see it for yourself. Well, that statement could just as well apply to issues of the images of images of God. The picture will not adequately match the reality. Given our finite mortal minds, our attempts to depict God with images will always fall short of the real thing. Every time we try to depict, if we should, if we would, every time we might try to depict God, it will necessarily distort the God of truth every single time. And that's very much the message of the second commandment now before us here in Exodus chapter 20. So three things I'd like for us to see in our time together this morning. And the first of them here is in verses 4 and 5. The first thing is simply the command. The command. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything in the heavens above or the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. So this means that there's nothing in creation which we may use to depict or represent God. We may use nothing in creation to make an image of him, to turn into an icon or an aid for devotion. God may not be represented by creaturely form nor by the inventions of a creaturely imagination. Why not? Well, if you think back with me in your New Testaments, or think forward, I suppose, in your New Testaments to John chapter 4, remember Jesus when he's speaking to the Samaritan woman. There in John 4, verse 24, he says, God is spirit. God is spirit. The confession expands on that and says, God is a most pure spirit, invisible without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible. Or, if that's a bit wordy, you really can't go wrong with the theology in our children's catechism. Uh, The boys and girls might know the answer from the children's catechism. It's quite simply, what is God? God is a spirit and does not have a body like men. We are not to make images of God because all images, whether they're sculpted or painted or acted or imagined in our minds, they will all inevitably fall short of the truth. God is to be worshipped not by the inventions of our own minds, beloved, or our own preferences. That is the overarching thrust of the second commandment. 
as our Westminster Catechism so helpfully teach us. And, you know, this is not just strict teaching from some overzealous Presbyterians. The truth is the Lord God knows us, and he has said that this is what the sinful human heart is inclined to do, to make idols after the image of creatures. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, the Apostle Paul says that although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. To, to conceive of God by images of our own invention, Paul the Apostle is saying, is the fruit of foolish minds. It's our sinful arrogance on display. We think we know better than the word of God. But we, brothers and sisters, do not make God. That's what we sang in Psalm 95. We did not make him. He made us, not we ourselves. We do not depict him. Rather, he reveals himself to us as he comes to us in his holy word. Now, let's just say that sometimes one of the misunderstandings that people state is, well, as I'm reading the second commandment, does this mean that's a prohibition against all art? Does God hate all artistic skillfulness? Is this a, a prohibition against making a, a picture of a mountain or a, or a picture of birds or, or a sculpture like Michelangelo's David? Well, well, no. I rather like the King James Version where it translates the Hebrew here. It, it, I'm using the ESV translation this morning. It says carved image, but the way the King James renders it is graven image. You see, an idol was something crafted by a tool. Now, whether it was carved out of wood or chiseled out of stone or engraved in metal, it was cut and it was shaped by human hands. It was a man-made representation of some divine being. That's why the later Old Testament prophets mock the idolaters so much for worshiping their man-made idols. You ever stop and think about that? Uh, that essentially what the prophets are getting at is they're, they're telling these folks as they worship these man-made idols, you people pray to this thing like a god. You made it. You chop down the tree and you, you carve this little wooden statue with your own hands and now you, you worship it as if it were divine. It's your hobby plaything, and you're praying to it. How utterly absurd and utterly preposterous. No, the, the second commandment did not mean that the Israelites were forbidden to use tools or to produce any kind of artwork. Later, when it was time to build the tabernacle, God sent the Israelites his spirit to, quote, make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. That's Exodus 31, verses 4 and 5. I love what our, our sister tradition, the Continental Reformed tradition, says in the Heidelberg Catechism, number 97. I think it's very helpful at this point also. Here's, here's what it says. The question is, may we then not make any image at all? The answer is, God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Although creatures may be portrayed, yet God forbids making or having such images in order to worship them or serve God through them. What the second commandment ruled out was making things to serve as objects of worship or depiction of the deity. And that's clarified for us in the second part of the rule there in verse 5. You see what it says? You shall not bow down to them or serve them. And we get more clarification with a list of the kind of idols that God forbids there in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. That's pretty comprehensive. Remember and recall the historical context that Moses has in mind here and that the Israelites would have had in mind here as he's handing down the law to them, as the Lord is handing down the law to them. The Israelites had just been living with the Egyptians for 400 years in slavery. And the Egyptians worshipped all kinds of gods, a panoply of false gods and false idols. And nearly all of the Egyptian pagan deities were represented in the form of animals. The god Horus, for example, had the head of a falcon. Uh, Anubis had the head of a jackal, and so on. And so the Lord God knows human frame. He knows mortal minds. He knows that our imaginations and our hearts will incline towards that which is familiar. And he knows 
that his people uh, were likely to be influenced in their worship ideas by Egyptian paganism. Of course, the Lord God has proven right, isn't he, in just a few chapters in Exodus chapter 32 with the golden calf. Now, I also want to say that there's another thing that's worth saying, another thing that's worth noting, is that contrary to what some detractors might say, Reformed and Presbyterian people don't just like making up rules for the sake of making up rules. Uh, sometimes when people encounter this teaching on the second commandment, they, they think it's just a kind of legalism. Extra made-up rules meant to rain on someone's enthusiasm or, or impose some sort of dour demeanor upon people. And of course, the answer to that charge is no, absolutely not. This understanding of the second commandment is not rooted in a severity, a man-made severity, or a kind of gleeful harshness. It's motivated out of a love for God. Now, that's the truth, isn't it, brothers and sisters? We love God. And because we love God, we want to do things which please God. And it's really not any more complicated than that. And, and because God in his holy word has said, do not make any images of me, well, we take him at his word and we strive to obey him in that regard. And so, while all Christians love God, surely, in distinction from our Lutheran and Anglican and other Protestant brethren, we are persuaded that a, a policy of no images of God, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, is the most faithful manner in which to obey this command from God himself. We love him, our creator, our glorious redeemer and savior. We love him, and so we want to do what pleases him especially when he has told us exactly what pleases and what displeases him. Now, imagine with me for a moment, if my wife asked me in a few years from now, Sean, for your 40th birthday, if I can take you anywhere in America, where would you like to go? And I said to her, you know what, sweetheart, I'd love to get a cabin out west. I'd love to take you and the kids, maybe somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, or maybe somewhere beautiful like Zion National Park, something like that. And she in turn says to me, great. I've just booked a week for you to go swamp hunting gators in the Louisiana Bayou. I, I didn't say that at all, <laughs> not even close. And if I, she said that to me, I would begin to question my wife's hearing or perhaps her affection for me in striving such a getaway and birthday present. Likewise with the Lord our God. He has told us what he loves, and he's told us what displeases him. And so we ought to strive to live and worship accordingly, brothers and sisters. And so this is why, historically speaking, Reformed and Presbyterian churches have not had images of Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit in their church buildings, for example, whether on posters or stained glass windows or Sunday school materials. That's why, classically speaking, we discourage images of Jesus being used in children's Bibles or certain TV productions like the current popular one, The Chosen. As an aside, you should be aware that that TV show is also heavily influenced by heretical Mormon theology. Uh, they put lots of words in Jesus' mouth that he never said, according to the scripture. And so besides being a second commandment issue, it's also tainted and influenced by the teachings of an unbiblical cult. You should just be aware of that. Maybe some of your neighbors need, need to be aware of that. But then again, the question comes, understandably so, Jesus was a man. He had a human body, did he not? Well, yes, he did. And he does. The problem, though, is that unlike us, Jesus has two natures. We have one nature. We are human beings. But Jesus is God and man, two natures in one person. And so that means, beloved, that if we attempt to paint a merely human Jesus, we are not accurately representing the only Jesus Christ of Nazareth who's ever existed. God and man, two natures in one person forever. How can one rightly depict Jesus' divinity? We can't. And so even if we could rightly depict Jesus' humanity, it would still be a sub-biblical, incomplete, impoverished, and inaccurate Jesus. A picture of simply the humanity of Jesus alone is not a picture of the whole, full, and biblical Jesus Christ. Folks may be well-intentioned, but these efforts ultimately flip the formula around, don't they, as one man said. In, in attempting, however piously intended, it's an effort to walk by sight and not by faith. And that order is completely in reverse, isn't it? The Bible gives us the only access we have to Jesus Christ. We need no other. 
We must learn to be content with the voice of God speaking in the Holy Scripture, beloved. But what about, what about as a teaching tool, Pastor Sean? Uh, that's something we often hear, even in the PCA. Uh, simple images of Jesus in, in story Bibles for children. Right? Not for worship, don't bring them into the sanctuary so that we pray towards them during the service, but just for, for pedagogical purposes, for example. Again, an understandable question. But I rather like the answer given, again, from the Heidelberg Catechism, this time question number 98. It says this, what about using images for pedagogical purposes? No, and here's the line, for we must not pretend to be wiser than God, who will have his people taught not by dumb images, and by that it means mute, non-speaking images, not taught by that, but by the lively preaching of his word, close quote. See, this is the crux of it, beloved. Our attitude to the second commandment ultimately comes down to this. We must not think ourselves to be wiser than Almighty God. We cannot improve upon the plan for our piety that he's already given to us in the scripture. It is interesting, by the way, at least I find it interesting, that as much detail as the Bible gives to so many things, right? Like, for example, the, the cubits of length that when Noah built the ark, or the number of blue thread loops on the curtains for the tabernacle. For all of those details that were given, we are not given a detailed description of the visage of Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, Isaiah chapter 53, in describing the appearance of the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus, Isaiah 53 says that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he was, by human appearance standards, rather unremarkable. Even the description given to us of the glorified King Jesus in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, it is rather restrained, isn't it? And rather generic in how it describes him. Moreover, when it comes to the image of God, the Bible consistently speaks of Jesus as the image of God. Colossians 1, verse 5. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. In the upper room, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough. Just let us see God. To which Jesus replies, have I been with you so long that you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, brothers and sisters, if you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus Christ. And, and where do you find out what Jesus Christ is like? How, how might you see Jesus in a manner of speaking? It's right here. Right here in his word. He's been pleased to reveal himself to you. You don't have to go hunting for him. You, you don't have to, there's no need to conjure up your own method for figuring out what he's like or searching him out. It's, it's right here. He's made it available, and he's brought it to you, his people. Here you may discover his person, his character, his attributes, his message. Learn of his life and atoning death. Learn of his glorious resurrection, his words of love and life. Jesus is enough. He is the image of the invisible God. He is God's self-disclosure to you, Christian. You may see God in him, and you may meet him in this book, in the pages of Holy Scripture, God's revelation of himself. God is a spirit, as our catechism says, and no image can do him justice. So that's the first thing, the command itself. But then secondly, and much more briefly, again in verse 5, the basis of the command. The basis of the command. Here's one of the reasons God gives us to obey this commandment. You shall have no other gods before me, he says, you shall not make any carved images. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Jealousy is one of those attributes when, when, when we employ it, it's often sinful. Jealousy for our neighbor's possessions makes us covet and break the Tenth Commandment, for example. But our God is holy, and all his actions and all his adjectives and all his attributes are always holy and without sin, without taint. And so for the Lord God Almighty to be jealous for the affections of his people is a good and holy and sinless thing. One commentator puts it like this. Divine jealousy is not the insecure, insane, and possessive human jealousy. Rather, it is an intensely caring devotion to the objects of his love. Isn't that lovely? In a similar way that a mother is jealous to guard the safety of her children, 
Or, or a husband is jealous for his wife's affection and he would never wish to find her drawn into the arms of another man. So too is God with his people. An intensely caring devotion to the objects of his love. That's you and me, dear believer. The second commandment tells us that God has a zeal for you, his people, such that we would not settle for a cheap, paltry, and ultimately unsatisfying substitute, but that you would only settle for the real thing, God himself. And what is the evidence of God's jealous zeal for the love of his people? Well, it's this. God has demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. See, the cross, where the image of the invisible God, Christ, God in flesh, was maimed and torn and slain. We think on the cross and we realize here is the measure of his commitment to this guarding of your hearts. Here is the measure of his commitment, to, of his love towards you, his people. The second commandment is actually an expression not of harsh, binding restrictiveness. It's actually an expression of God's zealous love for his people's hearts in order that we might know him as he really is. So that's the second thing. First, the command, then the basis of the command, and then thirdly and finally, the promise accompanying the command. The promise accompanying the command. Look at verses 5 and 6 again. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. There's a promise there of both judgment and grace. You see that? We often struggle with this commandment, especially that promise of judgment, because it seems to us unfair. Four generations are visited on account of the iniquity of the fathers. And yet, despite our discomfort, we have to admit that we have seen this reality play out, haven't we? Some of you have likely seen this in your own families or maybe in the families of your relatives or neighbors where patterns of rebellion crop up generation after generation, devastating effects that pass on from grandfather to father to son to grandchild, wrecking families for generations. There's a healthy fear and trembling that should come upon us when we read this command for us to consider the prospect. What happens if I play fast and loose with God, with who he is? What happens if I disregard his word and rather than trying to bring my life into conformity with his word, I try to accommodate God to my preferences? What happens? It's a dangerous thing, not just for our own souls, but for our household and for generations to come. What will the inheritance be that you leave to your children or your grandchildren? Will we love God and love him the way that he has instructed? Will our children see us praising Christ, confessing sin, repenting for the ways that we failed and striving to follow after him in the newness of life? Or will they not? Notice here the word to parents, to fathers especially. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, and showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandment. Dads, it is our task in particular to pursue the hearts of our children. Will we teach them the truth and point them to Christ? Will we model godliness and faithfulness for them? Will we pray with them and for them? Will we ensure that we are with them in that place that God has ordained Lord's Day by Lord's Day here in this place to hear his word proclaimed that they might come to embrace Christ and receive the words of life eternal? That's our calling. Now hear this, if you are single or if you are widowed or you're not yet married, you are still a mother or father figure to the covenant children of this congregation. If you're a member of this church, you vowed at these children's baptism to assist their parents in rearing them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Your covenant children look up to you too. I tell this to my congregation all the time, and I'm sure that this is true in the life of, your, of the body here at First Pres Dillon, how thankful I am for how you model love for Christ to them. I, I, love, I love to hear my children talk about people in our church who aren't related to us. I really do. They come up to me after the Sunday services, Dad, you should, have, you should have heard Mr. So-and-so praying today in Sunday school. It was great. 
Dad, did you see Miss So-and-So singing the hymns in worship today? You could tell she loved it. Did you hear her talk about Christ? You could tell she loves him. First Presbyterian Church, adults, you are fathers and mothers in the faith to our covenant children in a real way, even if they're not your blood relation. I know your elders love you for it. Help us leave a legacy of faith to a thousand generations by loving God and keeping his commands. And just by way of conclusion, let me ever so briefly mention the connection here to the sacraments, to baptism and the Lord's Supper. How often people crave images. They, they desire things to look at, things they can touch, perhaps, in an effort to have some connection to the Lord, to, to visualize Jesus' love for his people, to have a better tangible understanding, something to re understand, relate to, to apprehend him better. This, very often, I think, is a natural desire, but too often it mutates and morphs into idolatry, doesn't it? We do not worship God through images or craft images of him. However, isn't it wonderful that in his kind condescension to us as flesh and blood people who so often crave tangible things to see and taste and grip, God, our Father, has, to use Calvin's language, stooped down to meet us in our weakness. And he gives us these tangible signs and tokens to sustain our faith. We say we need something visible. God has given that to us in the sacrament. Here's the images that he's provided. God's visible word, as it's often called, the, the waters of baptism splashing in the basin and poured upon the heads of covenant children and new converts born again to Christ. A loaf of bread and a cup of wine, broken and held and touched and eaten, that cup poured out and held in our hands, smelled by our senses, tasted and consumed upon our lips. Isn't our God wonderful? Isn't he tender? Isn't he kind to give us such tangible signs, his sacraments? Because here we may look and see and taste and smell and hear and eat. A tangible reminder of God's steadfast love and his faithfulness to his people. We, we see those waters and we taste that bread and we taste that cup and we are reminded again and again and again of Christ's dogged commitment to be true to his covenant and to be kind to our souls, no matter what it costs him and no matter what we deserve. What a mercy it is that he's given us such gifts. The second commandment says that we do not imagine or worship God in whatever way best pleases us, but rather it teaches us that we bow in holy awe and we conform ourselves to his sovereign will. And it is his sovereign will to be merciful to us in Christ. And in Christ, he has provided more than all we need. Praise him for it. Let's pray together. Lord, we do bless you for your word, and we praise you for speaking to us in it. And we ask now that you would seal your word to our hearts as we've thought upon these things this morning. We ask that you would conform us to the image of Christ that you'd fill our hearts with more ardent love for him, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Be with us now. Help us to continue to prepare our hearts to worship you on this, your glorious day. We ask it all for Christ's sake. Amen.